Uh, Amy Julia Becker, thank you for joining us. We appreciate you lending your time and insight for us today. Uh, Amy Julia, you have a double name. That's one of the first things I noticed about you. My wife has a double name, so you understand the difficulties of having a double name. What What's that like? What are, what are some things that uh, people may not know about a double name? Huh. Well, yes, thank you for having me and for pointing out that I do have a double name because I go on a lot of podcasts where I'm called Amy the whole way through. And it, so that's one thing that people might know. I mean, it is an awkward thing to have a double name. And so you have to be kind of committed to it to have gotten, you know, into your 40s and still be going by the double name. Like, I know people who just abandoned it long ago. I did go for as AJ for a long time when we first moved from North Carolina to Connecticut in North Carolina. At least I could, ex like, people were, like, familiar with the concept of a double name. Whereas in Connecticut, I get a lot of blank stares. But then I got married to someone from, Vir well, we were living in Virginia. And so I went back as an adult to the double name and just at least let people know that AJ stands for Amy Julia. Uh, and a lot of people do now call me Amy Julia. And sometimes I hyphenate it even though that's kind of not what it is, but just to try to let people know. So yeah, double names are awkward, but I like them. You know, I like them a lot. Well, and then, yeah, to your point, once you get married, you add an additional name, a fourth name, and then what do you do with that? <laughs> and what do you call your middle name? And what, you know, it, it's it's complicated. <laughs> yeah, so like my, my wife is Grace Ann. She also sometimes, I call her GA sometimes, and she's holding on strong at the double name. My My brother is a John Michael, he dropped the Michael once he got old enough, so he abandoned the double name, and so just it's it's a uh, it's a it's a challenging challenging world world out there for those who have double name. Um, but yeah, you you've uh, graciously joined us today to talk about your new book. It's called To Be Made Well, and uh, this is a topic that we within our ministry has talked a lot about. Just the idea of wholeness. That's been um, our theme for uh, just this past year, and and really leaning into what does it look like to be emotionally, spiritually, physically, relationally whole, uh, and all the things that go into that. Um, so would you just mind starting us off by talking about what the idea of wholeness means to you and, you know, why you wanted to write a book about it? Yeah, absolutely. So you touch on it in just those words you just used in terms of like physically, emotionally, spiritually, relationally, there's a sense of uh, wholeness that comes when we are not just uh, made well within ourselves, although even that from most modern Western people, I think there's a disconnect between our bodies, our minds, and our spirits. We even talk about those as like, as if they are different parts of ourselves instead of understanding that as like an integrated whole. But then even if we were perfectly integrated body, mind, spirit, there are all these people, there's the, actually the creation. And then of course there's God and that sense of being in right relationship and in reciprocal relationship, like a back and forth with a mutual giving and receiving with the people in our lives, with the creation that we are a part of our kind of our local communities, as well as like the actual nature aspect of creation and with God. I think all of those together are what we're talking about when we're talking about wholeness. So what would you say are some of the, the biggest challenges, obstacles as it relates to pursuing wholeness and, um, just being healthy in all these different areas in our lives that, to your point, are compartmentalized at times, but are so woven together and so connected? Yeah, so that is such a great question and something I thought about a lot in writing To Be Made Well was like, what are the barriers? What keeps us? I think everyone would be like, yeah, sure, wholeness, healing. That sounds great. Who doesn't want that? And yet we experience a lot of chronic pain in our society, even with the modern medicine that we have. We experience certainly a lot of loneliness and emotional pain, mental illness, um, not to mention just disconnects and polarization in our society more broadly. And so I used the lens of um, a story from Mark 5 in the Gospels, where Jesus is healing uh, a woman who's been bleeding for 12 years, as well as Jairus, uh, who's a synagogue ruler. And Jairus comes to Jesus asking for healing for his daughter as a way to look at what is healing and wholeness, but also what keeps us from that. And when I looked at that story, to me, there were four things that really came up that keep us from experiencing 
and even knowing how to access healing and wholeness. And one is shame. Another is fear uh, or anxiety. Um, another is distraction, uh, which is actually probably the beginning, right? We distract ourselves. And so we don't even feel the fear and the anxiety. And then the other is status, just the way that we're cut off from each other because of our social positions and status. So I think all of those play different roles in keeping us from healing. And thankfully, I also believe that like God's healing comes in not because we've perfectly overcome our distractions and we're like not looking at the iPhone anymore. Um, God's healing comes in in the midst of our distracted lives that are often filled with shame and fear and social hierarchies. Um, so it's not as though we have to overcome all those barriers in order for God to love us and want to bring us to a place of healing. But seeing the way those barriers can get in the way of that healing has also been really helpful to me. Yeah, talk talk more about the idea of distraction because I can so relate to that. I mean, it's, it's like a coping me- mechanism to, um, some of the, the, the struggles and the, um, when, when we don't feel whole, you know, we often turn to things that distract in order to cope with that. Um, so, so what is it that, that God can offer us in those moments that the things of this world can, cannot, the, the, the distractions that we tend to turn to? I think the distractions that, you know, that we tend to turn to, and obviously our um, phones and kind of entertainment are very obvious examples of that. But even for me, like checking the news, which you, I mean, that's not a bad thing to do, but it can still distract me, whether it's from like my child who is in the room with me or my friend, or it can distract me from experiencing a feeling of loneliness or discontent. And yet if I'm willing instead attend to the person or that emotion and to sit in that discomfort, I think that's what actually allows some curiosity about like, why am I feeling this? And the question of like, is God present and could God be present? And what could God do in this place? I think that's true for physical pain as well. I mean, I know i literally, when I have physical pain, have you ever done this where you like dig your fingernails into a different part of your body to take pain away? It's like, like, let me distract one, you know, I've got so much pain in this place, I'll try to put it somewhere else. And I think that's kind of what distraction can do instead of being like, how about we just take care of that pain that is, that's hurting so much? Like, why hurt yourself somewhere else? But I do think that, um, again, we distract ourselves to try to not feel pain. But if we can actually sit with that pain, there's and I'm not just talking about physical pain, um, but if we can sit with that, I think there's a lot of uh, healing work that God can do. So then what are the next steps? You know, we, we sit with that pain, we acknowledge it. Um, we, we don't just turn to something else to distract us from it, but we, we sit with it. What, what happens next? What do you, what do you recommend yeah. next? Thankfully, we don't need to get stuck sitting with it because that would just be miserable. And that's probably why we keep ourselves from doing that in the first place. Um, When I looked again at that story, and not just the story in Mark 5, but all these different um, stories of Jesus healing people, there was this pattern of paying attention to pain. And I think that literally can mean like, okay, why am I feeling this way, whether that's physically or emotionally, um, and just noticing where am I holding tension in my body? How can I pray about that? Um, So it's acknowledging the pain, but it's also asking for help. And that I think can happen both vertically and horizontally, so to speak, where it's like, I'm actually bringing this to God in prayer and asking for help in the same way that people like fling themselves at Jesus's feet. But also asking for help. I mean, we have been told that we are given one another too. And so that might mean going to see a doctor, like in a very practical help type of way. But it also might say, hey, I'm really struggling here. Can you, you know, take a walk with me or help me think through what it might mean to actually um, deal with the fact that I have been doing X, Y, or Z destructive behavior in my life. And people tend to respond when we ask for help, but it's hard to do that. Uh, And then I think the last thing... I read in a book, someone who used the phrase surrendering to healing, because there is a sense of just like having to let go of a thought that I'm going to fix myself or that I need to fix myself before God will love me. So there's a sense of like surrendering to the love of God that is weirdly also challenging for us. And yet such a, such a tremendously beautiful experience if we actually can come into the presence of God's love. And again, I think there are lots of spiritual practices that can allow us 
can more enter into that. Um, but those are what I think of as kind of the three steps, um, not to make it too simplistic, but as like acknowledging that pain, asking for help, and then surrendering to healing. Yeah, and I feel like the, the asking for help part of it um, and just inviting others into your pain and um, really, really expedites the healing process. And it, it's something that there may have been a stigma surrounding it uh, previously, but but in the past few years, uh, especially, we've just seen uh, the power of being able to talk about it and empathize with other people and hold space with other people and let other people know that, hey, I'm going through this too, or I've been through this. Like, this isn't something you and you alone have to deal with. Like, let let me come alongside you and, and help you in that journey. And I just, I think that speaks to the power of community and having people in your life um, who can do that. Um, I know for you, you know, this, this, this idea of wholeness has kind of been a, a personal journey for you, um, especially with your daughter, Penny. Um, how would you say having a child with a disability has, has kind of changed the way that you've thought about healing and the, the idea of wholeness? So I think it has, yes, been really transformational for me in many ways to have a child with a disability. Penny has Down syndrome and she's 16 now. And I know when she was first born, I had like a um, kind of a religious understanding of the world that said that disability was brokenness, like was the same as brokenness, was the same as not sin in like a moral sense, like that, not like she had done something wrong. She was clearly a baby, but like something had gone wrong in the universe and that was being born out in every chromosome and uh, cell of her body. and over time, I was like, this isn't making sense. Like that was kind of my framework for disability, but it didn't make sense of my experience of her belovedness and her giftedness and her alive, just her nature. And so I started doing a lot of reading and thinking and praying and, and experiencing this child. And over time, I really started to see that, yes, there was brokenness in her, just like there was in me, but there also was just like human limitation. And I was calling human limitation, human brokenness. And when I started to see that and see that in myself, I was like, oh, there's beauty in our limits because it forces us to need one another and to rely on the love of other people. And everyone who has limits also has gifts, also has an opportunity to bring love into the world. And so I just started to see healing really differently. So it wasn't about fixing people <laughs> fixing my child who had a disability. Um, it wasn't even about curing so much as it was about what we talked about in the beginning, that sense of wholeness and relationship. Even um, there's a biblical word, you know, perfect. Like uh, Jesus at one point says, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. And I thought about perfect babies and how, you know, in the hospital, it was very clear that I had not been given a perfect baby by like American standards. But when I learned that that word biblically is actually the word for um, telos, which means like the end for which you are created. So be perfect means live to into what you have been created to be. That's really different than conform to the norm of American society. And so there's a real freedom that comes in trusting that we've been made well and that even in the midst of our brokenness, God is continuing to invite us into that wholeness, um, piecing us back together, even using our brokenness to bring blessing and goodness into the world. So Penny in my life has kind of sparked an exploration of healing that has been really different, not only in how I see her, but how I see myself. And it's how I see what it means, yeah, to be made well or to be made whole. Yeah, I like that. And what would you say, what what role is there for Jesus as a healer today, especially in the sense of, you know, acknowledging that his power is made perfect in our weakness, but also we serve, you know, a, a, a big God who is able to he heal and is willing to heal. Um, so, so what role would you say that there is for, for Jesus as a healer today? You know, I think there's a big role. Like, I, I mean, again, one of the things that prompted me to write the book was this sense of, this Jesus as a healer is still really relevant. And that's true, again, physically, emotionally, relationally, in all of these different ways. I think for a long time, I really thought that like antibiotics and surgeries had taken the place of what 
Jesus was doing when it came to healing. And then when I looked more deeply at it, I saw that, yes, there was a physical component, and I believe there still can be to Jesus's healing. But even more so, there was a sense of him restoring people to their own purpose and sense of self, restoring them in relation to God and restoring them in relation to community. Uh, so there's also that aspect of healing. And what's amazing is that like our physical well-being is bound up in all of those things. Uh, if there's anything we've learned in modern medicine, it is that the role of stress and isolation in uh, disease and in whether that's mental or physical deterioration. And so when we are more connected to other people, when we are living in our bodies and accepting our bodies, when we are, you know, even just like eating foods that we enjoy with people who we love, like there's like a healing that happens. And I don't mean to say God can't also do miraculous works of healing, but I think that's actually even in the Gospels, less the point than I once thought, um, and that the greater point is that uh, Jesus is trying to get our attention and help us understand what it means for God to want to heal us and to have healing be available to all of us. So with, I'm sure you've experienced this just with your personal journey, but what would you say to people who have maybe prayed for healing just, just over time and didn't get or haven't gotten the the miracle that they were looking for. Yeah. I struggled with that in writing the book because I wanted so much to make sure that there was no sense of if you have enough faith, then you will be healed. You know, like there's nothing simplistic about this. And actually I really looked at the fact that people who did get healed by Jesus did not have enough faith. I mean, they said that, like, there's the man who's like, I believe, help my unbelief. Or, you know, this woman who reached out her hand and was scared of Jesus. Like it says that when she finally came to him, she was trembling with fear. Like she didn't have a lot of faith. She had a teeny tiny bit and she was healed. So there's not this like correlation between big faith and big healing. Um, if, if anything, there's a fact, a correlation between like little faith and big healing. So um, the first thing is just to say, this is not about people doing something wrong or being wrong or um, in some way or being rejected by God. And we have examples of people who aren't healed um, in the way that they might have expected, Paul being the you know kind of preeminent one as someone who says, I prayed for this thorn in my flesh to be taken away. And God said, no. And I think sometimes we in our bodies are called to bear witness to the brokenness in the world. And that's a, that's a big calling. It's not something I understand. I also think we sometimes experience healing in ways we don't expect. Um, I write in the book about my mother-in-law who was diagnosed with cancer and experienced a tremendous amount of healing in the six months leading up to her death. So it was not a physical healing, but the healing that she experienced relationally and spiritually and emotionally was really powerful and beautiful. So I think we need to expand our understanding of healing, but also recognize that God is present even in the experience of not being healed the way we might hope to be. And it's also not a bad thing or a lack of faith to hope for that. Yeah. I like you had a quote in there that said, healing is not a reward. Healing is a gift of grace. And it just goes back to your idea of that we can't, like it, it's not predicated on the amount of faith that we have or how obedient we are. It's, it's truly a gift of God's grace. So I like that. And talk a little bit more about just the idea of healing surrounding, um, you know, emotional and spiritual pain. Uh, we talked about it a little bit earlier, but I mean, it, it's something we all deal with. We have friends, family who deal with it. Um, how, how can we approach just the, the healing process as it relates to the emotional and spiritual realms? Is it, is it similar to physical or, or do we approach it differently? Yeah, I do think it's similar. Um, for me, that idea of paying attention to pain is not simply a matter of, you know, when my shoulders hurt, because I've been, you know, hunched up tense at a desk. Although even that, on many of our physical aches and pains are related to the emotional aches and pains of our souls, I think. So when I'm stressed out, I tend to feel it physically. So there really is perhaps an emotional component to a lot of that type of physical um, experience. But sometimes it's just that um, sense of I'm in a place of pain with another person 
or when I think about my past, right? And so I think, again, actually paying attention to that instead of trying, we've talked about distraction, but we also have, I think another form of distraction is kind of numbing pain, where it's like, I would rather, you know, drink a couple of glasses of wine than think about the fact that uh, it was really painful for me when I was in high school and X, Y, and Z happened, right? Um, and I think a lot of us are kind of like, why do I have to go back and like keep paying attention to things that happened in my past that were painful. Why can't we just move on? And the reason to pay attention to pain in the past is for it to heal, not so that we can get stuck there. <laughs> um, so I do think that sense of paying attention and then again, asking for help. And that might mean going to see a therapist or, you know, a life coach or a spiritual director or, you know, joining a Bible study. It also may, again, asking for help might mean, you know, simply saying, Hey, Will you talk with me about this, uh, with just a, with a friend, about this um, pain that I'm experiencing with my sister, my mom, my husband, my child, my whoever? Uh, so I think there's a lot of, again, that same pattern of paying attention to pain, asking for help, and then uh, probably most importantly, like receiving God's love in the midst of that pain um, and understanding what does it mean to be someone who's been beloved and made well by God. And for someone walking through that, at, at what point would you recommend going to seek professional help versus just uh, taking that pain to, to a friend or, or a loved one? That's a great question. I mean, I think there's a sense of persistence where we sometimes need professional help when we recognize that I just keep coming back to the same place and, they, and I, I'm stuck there. Um, I also think it's... Although right now it's really hard to get professional help because so many of us are aware that we need it, like talking to so many people who are like, the waiting list is six months long. So, but a consult can be a way of saying to a professional, like no professional at this moment is like, you know, going to keep you longer than you need to be there, it seems to me. And so there is a sense of get a consultation and just say, hey, is this something I need professional help with? Or is this something that I could work through with some friends? And you probably can get an answer pretty quickly, even on that um, point. So I would not hesitate to get professional help. But I also would say that there is a lot of um, that support groups, like that's a kind of semi professional help in the sense of going to like a 12 step um, or other type of support group can give, you know, that's like one step beyond just chatting with my friend about a problem, um, having a commitment to some sort of support group. And then obviously there's the um, more official professional help as far as like therapy or, um, you know, some sort of like inpatient program. Yeah. I just, I, I think back to it's first Thessalonians five, where it talks about our, the idea of wholeness, our spirits, our bodies, our souls, they're all connected. They work together and it says they need to be uh, preserved. They need to be taken care of. They need our attention. And for some people that might mean going to get professional help for others. It might just mean unpacking it with a friend, but just pursuing that idea of wholeness and, and not distracting and not run uh, numbing and just running towards um, just, just healing in, in, in that sense. Um, Amy, Julia, was there anything else, any tangible next steps that you would recommend to people who uh, you know are continuing on the, the journey toward wholeness or want to start that process? What, what are some of the things that maybe we haven't talked about that you would recommend? You know, the thing that comes to mind for me, this is like a spiritual practice. And, um, you know, I think by the time this podcast airs, we'll be in the season of Lent, which is a time for spiritual reflection. And one practice that's been really helpful for me in all of this is called the examine. So it's taking a moment to look back on my day as almost like it was a movie, like I'm observing the different events of the day and asking the question, when was I aware of God's presence and when did it seem as though God was absent? And just paying attention to those moments, because I think those can be indications of when I'm in the presence of God, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, right? There's a sense of the wholeness of God being present. 
And when it, I'm experiencing God as absent, I'm probably in a place of either, you know, anger or bitterness or resentment. And th- those are some of my personal issues. I'm sure other people have different ones. But um, but what what's happening in those places? And I guess that's another way of saying paying attention to pain. But for me, that's a spiritual practice that when I learned about it, I don't know, a couple of years ago and started doing it daily, I really felt like I was able to be more aware of God's presence throughout the day and kind of, and when I was in that place of experiencing God's absence to come back. So that would be just one additional from like a spiritual perspective, next step that um, might be helpful to some people. Love it. Well, if someone is interested in learning more about you or your story or your work, where can they find that? Well, this is one advantage of the double name. No one else has the name that I know of, Amy Julia Becker. So you can find me at Amy Julia Becker in lots of places. I have a website, you know, amyjuliabecker.com, um, but I'm also on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter, you know, at Amy Julia Becker. Um, on Facebook, I think it's Amy Julia Becker Writer, but the other places, it's all just Amy Julia Becker. You can look me up. Perfect. You were able to lock in that domain name and those uh, handles pretty easily, huh? It was easy. So I don't know, Grace Ann, I don't, she might be able to get them real quick. <laughs> there you go. Well, Amy Julia, thank you again for taking the time. Her new book coming out soon, To Be Made Well. Amy Julia, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. It was really fun.